Welcome to Concord Matters, a show seeking for Concord, agreement in Christian confession. Concord mattered to Jesus and Paul, and so it does to us also. Spend these next 60 minutes as we talk matters of Concord. Concord Matters, a program produced by the Christ-centered leader in confessional broadcasting, Worldwide KFUO, online at kfuo.org. And welcome to Concord Matters, the show where we seek to be of one mind, that is the mind of Christ. And to do that, a couple of Christ-confessing Concordians confer with the Book of Concord to conform what we believe, teach, and confess according to Scripture in our Lutheran Confession of the Faith. On today's show, we're going to discuss why Concord matters for making sacred art. I'm your host, Pastor Sean Smith, pastor of the Evangelical Lutheran Dual Parish of Emmanuel West Point in St. Paul's Wine Hill in Southern Illinois. And my companion confessor in conversation about this matter today is Mr. Edward Riojas. He's an artist of sacred themes and also secular themes. Mr. Riojas, welcome to Concord Matters. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, it is a real honor to have you on this week to talk about making sacred art. And this comes after the show I did last week with Pastor Jim Remke, Why Concord Matters for Liturgical Art. And it is always great to talk the Lutheran confessions with pastors. We dig into those really well, and we give some principles for what it means to be a confessional Lutheran on these various matters. But I must confess that while I was doing the show with Pastor Remke, I really just kept thinking the whole time, this is great, but I think I need to do a follow-up episode to this because I really want to talk to an artist, a Lutheran artist, who actually takes the principles and puts them into practice in making confessional sacred art. And so today's show is going to be a little bit different. I don't know that we'll be going directly to the Book of Concord at all today. But at the same time, this is a follow-up to last week's episode and a little more of a focus on putting the principles into practice with someone who actually does it. Because I think the work that you do in making sacred art certainly is confessional. So that is probably a good place to start. And maybe it is a bit of a broad question here. And so we'll try to distill this down more over the course of today's show. But to get us started here, I'll just ask broadly, what does it mean to you to be a confessional Lutheran artist? Well, there's all kinds of things to approach this, but an artist can be, they're just known to be loose cannons at times. So we're a peculiar bunch, and when you do find liturgical Lutheran artists, we are a very small bunch. So, you know, it comes down to this. When you're faced with an opportunity to put anything on a canvas or sculpt anything, you have to be very precise about what exactly it is you're going to do. You know, I mean, there's a whole range of what you could do, but when it comes to what you should do, the options narrow considerably. And it's fun to take the things that, well, for instance, I was brought up in an LCMS church and home, and so, yeah, I understand, you know, all the things in the catechism and stuff, but putting those into practice, making them visual, that's a whole, that's a whole new ballgame. And it's fun for me, and it's also challenging, and it's also humbling, I and mean, there's, there's all sorts of ways to slice this, but yeah. Yeah, I think what you said there, you have to be very precise about what you are going to do. And you said, I think you said artists can be viewed as loose cannons and so forth. And I kind of agree with that, too. I think that we always tend to think of art as just this great freedom and there's no constraints and just whatever comes to mind you do and, and put down and so forth. And I'm not a great artist by any means, especially when it comes to the visual arts. I would be more in music and things like that. But as I've tried my hand at kind of the artistic task and so forth, I at least find that, yeah, you do need some constraints. And so you talked about that. So what would some of those be? What would be those very precise things that inform how you approach sacred art? Okay, so for me personally, I've always gone the representational approach. And in art terms, that means if I draw a person, it should look like a person. I'm not going to do a swoosh of color and say, well, this represents a person. Because when you come in the realm of the church, you have to be crystal clear. You can't muddy the waters. You, and you, to be honest, even though I may say this represents something, I can't be next to whatever art I create and explain that to everyone. The art has to stand on its own. So in practical terms, what happens is 
I use things that artists throughout the history of the church have used. You know, I don't stray too far from that. You know, you put a circle and, hey, that means eternity. Or you put it behind the head of a person, oh, this person must be a saint. These little things that we just for the most part, people have grown up with or they sort of have a hint of what's going on. So when you stray from that, as I said, and, you know, I have seen Christian artists who, who do this non-objective stuff, and that's fine, but it doesn't work in practical terms. It doesn't work in a setting of worship. It doesn't work when, you know, someone from outside the church sees it. And what are they supposed to get from that? So that's the real responsibility is expressing what you believe. And then expressing what you believe, or I might say, you know, given the nature of this show, especially that it confesses the faith, and you've certainly pointed to that, and you picked up on what Pastor Jim Remke was talking about last week as well, of these images are things that the church has used throughout time, and that helps confess because we don't have to imagine, we don't have to have the artist there to explain that. And earlier, just you mentioned, you know, when it comes to the catechism and confessing that, that's a little bit different task and a little bit harder to do. And so obviously, as you said, using some of those traditional images and themes that the church has always used to confess the faith. But again, get us a little deeper into how do you express the faith when it comes to, let's just stick with the catechism, as you brought that out as an example. Well, let's see. The catechism is a bit hard because there's concepts that are uh, not, I can't really say they're universal. We understand them. You and I understand them. Well, in part anyway, as, as well as we can. But it does, it gets a little tricky. So, for example, when we're talking of, well, the office of the keys, if, if we talk about that, that's pretty easy. We just use a couple of cross keys. That's been used throughout you know, the generations. When we talk about the Lord's Prayer, however, that's a little harder because it is just so full. It's like, how do you take this wonderful divine concept and condense it into something that it really can't be condensed into? So for something like that, I may use a symbol of incense, a censer with the incense sort of lofting up. It doesn't point directly at it, but it gives you an idea of what it is. You know, our prayers rise up as incense, that idea. So there's subtle ways that you can sort of coax an image into the way that you want it to go. But yeah, with, with things related to the catechism, it becomes a little more difficult. But those broader things, that's where we can lean on things that others who've gone before us, they've invented the wheel. So why try to you know reinvent it? And there's sort of a parallel path that music takes in this direction too you know you could make any kind of music you want but some is not really appropriate and others are like wonderful so why should you abandon them <laughs> you know it's like you have a choice why do something that's super cheap and looks cheap and sounds cheap go for the rich stuff because that's what the lord is worthy of yeah i give a hearty amen to that but I want to back up to what you said about depicting the Lord's Prayer and using the incense of our prayers ascending before God, an image that comes to us from Psalm 141. Because at least historically, we've also used incense in our worship services. And so then, would it be fair to put it this way, that you're also drawing from the life of the church itself for the images? That what we see and experience in the life of the church helps give us the images to use in our sacred art. And that would seem simple enough, but then that particular image also makes me think that this too is part of the challenge that you were talking about because while prayer is primarily what the use of incense in a worship service is intended to convey, I think one of the reasons it has fallen out of use is because people have come to differing opinions on what its use in a service is to convey. And so I guess what then goes into your thought process in trying to meet that challenge of confessing the faith in a simple and clear way that people will get what it is trying to convey? Yeah, I, it's hard, again, because art, people have all kinds of takes on art, and some, you know, would say it's not really appropriate. Well, obviously I beg to differ because our Lord himself, you know, he could have explained precisely what happens in heaven, and no one would have gotten it. That's why he used these word pictures. You know, he used these simple devices that everyone can associate with. And so that's one reason to use the obvious. Now, sometimes in my art, I don't take the most obvious approach. Examples of this, I guess there's one piece that really sticks out. And I, 
when I was working on it, I actually had to ask my pastor, and I probably should do this more often, but, you know, I thought, am I getting, you know, walking on the edge of heresy here? Does this make sense? And the piece I'm thinking about specifically is the parable of the buried treasure, where it's an odd image, and I thought, this is weird, I have to check it out to make sure that I'm interpreting it correctly, and it turns out my interpretation was uh, not, not so common, but it's correct. And the long story, the back story of this painting is I started it ages ago, and I got just sort of to the, oh, the preliminary stage, so I threw it in a closet, and it sat in a closet for about a year and a half, and then someone asked, did you ever finish that painting? And I thought, no, I, you know, I didn't really, so I pulled it out and worked it up, and it has become quite popular, and it's still, you know, every time I look at it, it's, here's the thing, when I finish a piece, I don't think, look at the piece that I did. More often, I think of, oh, I'm as affected by it, and, and not because it's from my own hand, but it reminds me of things that the Lord has done. Now, the painting is this, and here's the short story. So I was, you always hear, perhaps more in Calvinistic circles, that I love the Lord so much. I love him. I love him. I love him. I love him. Well, that's fine. And then, then I thought, what about my own life? You know, I did such and such. Does that show my love for him? Yeah, not really. So this question of how much do I love him? And we're talking about the buried treasure. You know, people talk, oh, the Lord is my treasure. Well, yes, on the one hand. But here we're talking about the kingdom of heaven is like someone who bought a field, he buried a treasure. Well, okay, then I started thinking about that field of stones. And then I thought of a cemetery. And then I thought of my mind started going down these avenues that aren't typical. They To me, they didn't seem normal. And I felt like I was getting quite heretical about it. But then I thought, ah, so the image that I came up with is Christ coming back to that field of stones and claiming his treasure. He's pulling a casket out of the ground. And the parable is what? One sentence? For joy. He gave all that he had. Well, what did he have? His life. That's what he had. So it's the resurrected Christ pulling this casket out of the ground. And in a weird, okay, this is where this artist gets it. I signed it on the headstone of the, of the uh, grave that he's pulling it out of. And someone told me later, you're past your expiration date. <laughs> I'm just in awe to hear that story because that's one of my favorite pieces of your artwork. I love a lot of your artwork. I actually have my ordination certificate is one that you designed. Oh hanging in my office here. And so again, when it came to wanting to talk about what it is when we're talking about confessional art or sacred art for use within the life of the church, this is why I wanted to talk to you because again, you're confessing so much about the faith just in that image you give to us. And of course, limited on a radio show, we can't really quite show that, but I think you describe so many principles that go into that. And I commend you for checking in with your pastor as well but is a faithful confession of what scripture gives us to teach and to learn there. Right. There's, and again, with that painting, there's aspects that I haven't brought up. Like he's bringing this casket out and it's a, you know, it's a casket that's been in the ground. It's dirty. And this is his treasure. This is what he values. This person who could not escape his own box, you know, that's how helpless we were. There are other, I'm thinking of another painting too, that sort of, hit the chord in the same way among Lutherans, but it, it has a far different story. The parable of the buried treasure, that's quite popular, the image, you know, people buy prints of it a fair amount. But I did another image that when I first posted it, it got like, I think more than 10,000 hits on it. It was like, what is going on? And the image, it's precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So I used that part of scripture and I you know, put it on a little banner in the painting. But the image is of this pair of hands holding what is obviously a fetus or a stillborn baby. And the hand of the fetus is holding on to the thumb of one of the hands. And the hands are obviously pierced. And this obviously touched a lot of people, a lot of mothers who had stillborn babies and it was just you know, I had no idea that I would hit that nail so hard on the head and 
the interesting part is it got all kinds of attention, but no one, I think I've sold two prints of it, which is like not a whole lot. And I finally realized, you know, yes, people understand this, but it's almost too hard for them to actually face it every day on a wall. And stories like that, uh, feedback like that, it affects me. It's like, well, you know, this is what reality is, the side of heaven. And it kind of pokes really hard at my heart. Yeah, and I, I'm i familiar with that image, too. And I love it as well. Quite honestly, I've thought at times it'd be really nice to have this on the cover of a card that, especially as a pastor, you know, sometimes... Well, it's funny that you mention it because I do offer it. As a, that's one avenue that I found out that it worked was I put it on a very small blank, basically a sympathy card is what it is. Uh, and the, the card is intentionally small because some folks try to do the thing that they think is, is good and they write all kinds of stuff. But it's like, you don't have to write that much. Just be very brief and hopefully the image says enough. Yeah, because just to send that image, again, to face it on the wall every single day can just be really hard and really painful, especially for mothers to kind of relive. You know, there's a lot of emotion tied up in the loss of a child. Exactly. But in the moment when you're trying to convey sympathy, again, for myself as a pastor, just caring for those who are under my care as a pastor, you know, to send a card that can be really meaningful. And there, again, what I think is so wonderful about sacred art, confessional art, is so much of the faith is confessed just in the image itself. And I love what you say. You really don't have to write that much, which makes my job as a pastor a whole lot nicer than too, <laughs> when I can draw that image in. But then I also think of this too. So I'll confess, when I first saw that image, I didn't make the connection to an infant loss in terms of a miscarriage or things of that nature. I made the connection to pro-life. Oh. And, yeah. you know, we talk about the abortion industry, kind of the modern day, you know, slaughter of the innocents, if you will, in connection with, you know, Herod's slaughter of the innocents to try to get to the baby Jesus and so forth. And so for a while there, I kind of thought of that connection. And so maybe if you could just speak from an artist perspective again, and it's a wide range of artists and how you approach art and things like that, but speak then at least from your experience when it relates to confessional art, sacred art, what do you do with this, you know, what if they get the wrong idea or the wrong understanding? And Pastor Jim Remke talks some about that too, where it has to go with catechesis and teaching so that we, you know, are confessing the faith properly that these images and symbols that the church uses are to bring out. But I don't know, that's kind of a messed up, jarbled question there. No, I, I totally get it. I think here's what I've found works as a great fail faith. I learned fairly early on to include pieces of scripture, the actual text itself, because, you know, I can try all I want to get the point across that I, I'm trying to make, but if I fail, at least I have the scripture there. Uh, and the idea is to, you know, if there's some conflict, it's like I'm trying to point them to scripture. You know, I unlike other denominations, I'm, I'm thinking particularly of the Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, they have a very different view of sacred art, and so much so that their language about it is different. They don't say that you paint a piece of sacred art. They say you write it. So they equate the artwork with scripture they, as if you're a writer of scripture, which is like mind-blowing. You know, for other artists and for this Lutheran artist in particular, that's just, that's like, that is heresy, okay? <laughs> I mean, I can try to come very close to scripture. But if I screwed up, at least I have the text there to do it, to carry it through. And at the very least, I want to point folks to scripture. You know, if it seems odd, if the image doesn't quite seem right, well, look it up. So, you know, open your Bible. And if I need correcting, please <laughs> correct me. But the idea is to point folks to scripture, to urge them if they see an image. Oh, I never thought of it that way. Well, you know, look it up. So, yeah, I, I always worry if folks will take it wrong, and it is a huge responsibility. It's the same as any you know, musician in the church, or for that matter, you know, I suppose writing a sermon, I, I can only guess. You know, you, you have 
X amount of time and you, the words you want had better be the very best you can offer. It's the same with artwork. And in that way, it's extremely humbling. And let me say this. If there's anything that is wonderful that I don't even like to use the word inspirational, but there, if there's something that points you to Scripture, if there's something that is worthy of the church, that's the Lord's hand. And if you see anything in my artwork that's iffy or questionable or if the colors aren't quite right, that's my hand coming through. Yeah, I give a hearty amen to that, especially as you mentioned, it does relate some to sermons and I would even say to doing this radio show or any sort of creative task. I think of Johann Sebastian Bach, who signed all of his works solely Deo Gloria, you know, glory to God alone. That's a fitting way to end anything, I think, that involves the creative task that is to be in service to confessing the faith. Because anything that is worthy has to be God. And those things that don't quite convey what we want or didn't quite come through, well, then that's our poor sinful contribution to it. Which also then reminds me of Luther's sacristy prayer, which I like to use before I preach and even before I do the show. I love what Luther says so well there. He says, You see how unfit I am to administer rightly this great and responsible office. And had I been without your aid and counsel, I would have surely ruined it all long ago. But since you have appointed me to be a pastor and teacher and the people are in need of the teaching and the instruction, be my helper. Then if you are pleased to accomplish anything through me, let that be to your glory and not to mine or to the praise of men. I have that hanging in my office here. I mean, I just think that reflects what you're saying. It is a huge responsibility to apply the creative task and confess the faith clearly and well. But we trust that the Lord will guide it to his glory. And so again, as you did relate it to somewhat like the sermon task, or again, I think even doing the show for me, sometimes, you know, I pray for the Holy Spirit and guidance. I work all week on it, often even right up to the last minute. And then I always say it isn't quite finished until you say amen, but then I'll get done. And I still think uh, that's not quite finished and that's not quite right. That's didn't quite convey what I was hoping to there. So I always want to go back and fix it or I make notes, especially if I get some feedback about it for how I want to try and approach it better next time. And especially as I have a dual parish, when it comes to sermons, sometimes there's a lot of change or some correcting between the early service at Emmanuel to the later service at St. Paul's as I drive between them and I try to clean up the sermon. So I guess to that end, Since you brought in the word inspiration, and I don't quite like that word either, but for now I'll go with it. I guess a good question to ask is, especially as I think about my process in sermons and the show, how does the process of inspiration work for you when you set about the creative task, and how does it develop over the course of a project for you? Well, one of the benefits of being an artist and creating art is it's not all what folks may think it is. What I mean by that is that Coming up with a concept is one thing. It's very, you know, there's a lot of energy that goes into it. It's pretty quick. Uh, There's a lot of movement going on mentally and, you know, physically and all that. But when it comes to executing that idea, it's like watching paint dry, and it's very boring. So in that time, when I'm actually working on the thing, there is time for reflection to think about things. And I have done some paintings, some pieces where I've changed things along the way and say, you know, I could... I can make this better. One painting in particular is the parable of the prodigal son, which obviously it's not about the son, but that's the name of the painting, and everyone understands it. I did the painting for a Calvinist gentleman. He commissioned it. He had money to spare, and he wanted something to add to his collection, and I felt honored because he has Rembrandt prints of the prodigal son, etc. So this is like big stuff, and I knew my audience. And the image is of the prodigal son. He's front and center. But, of course, you see the father running toward his son. But I thought, you know what? I don't want him to think that the son is just walking to him on his own power. So at the very last minute, I painted in a symbol of the Holy Spirit as a dove behind him, like urging him on. (laughs) It's like, you don't do this by yourself. It's the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I was happy that I had the time to think about that, you know, last minute change. So, yeah, I, in a way I am affected. And sometimes during the times when I'm just, you know, my mind is on autopilot, when I'm actually doing brushstrokes or whatever, I'll add other little details or at least think about them like, yeah, can I do this better? Or eh. so That is, that's typically how I work. Otherwise, when it goes from the drawing stage to the, the final stage, it's generally 
fairly tight for me. It's just the way that I work. Some people would, you know, come at a piece totally differently, but I generally follow the general plan that I have fairly tightly. Yeah, and just is beautiful. I'm loving just hearing how you're coming up and describing from the artist himself all of my favorite pieces. Of course, I'm not really sure that I've encountered any of your pieces that I don't appreciate. So again, (laughs) great honor talking with you here. We're going to take a break here, but especially I want to pick up on the other side of the break, the insights that you can offer from your role as kind of a liturgical art consultant, if you will, as you meet with congregations and pastors to plan art for use within the church. So be sure to join us right after this break. You're listening to Concord Matters on KFU. Cross Defense is the show where we talk about curious topics to excite the imagination equip the mind, and comfort the soul with God's Word. Join me, Pastor Tyrell Bramwell, every Monday at 2 p.m. Central on KFUO Radio or anytime on KFUO.org or even your favorite podcast app. My friends, our foe is a fierce enemy. Our only defense is Christ on the cross. Welcome back to Concord Matters as we continue talking with Edward Riojas, who is a Lutheran artist of sacred but also secular art. And we'll come back to that maybe a little bit later. I do want to get his take on the difference between sacred and secular art. But first, in the first half of the show here, we talked quite a lot about kind of individual pieces that you have done for individual purposes. And I'm not quite sure if I'm wording that properly, but I think generally when we think of artists, we think of, you know, just doing a piece that's going to hang on the wall and maybe go in an art museum or, you know, those sorts of things like that. But I'm also quite familiar that a lot of the art that you actually do is specifically for use within sanctuaries and that a lot of your art actually is specifically designed and placed in sanctuaries. And so I want to get your take on that of how, you know, what is your approach as far as doing art for the worship space and placing it in a sanctuary? Right. As you said in the first half, the pieces that I talked about were non-commissioned pieces. In other words, they were pieces that I just felt compelled to do on my own. No one asked me to do them for the most part. The concepts and such were for my own funsies, if you will. But I do get approached by churches and individuals who commission me to do things. There can be a huge process or a simple process. You know, they may receive memorial funds and they say, hey, we need, we'd like you to do an altar cross or we'd like you to do this or that and that's where I come into play with whatever expertise I can offer and the approach is obviously different in that way totally different because there are often parameters that I have to follow and just the idea of doing something for a sanctuary that in itself tempers what I do when I'm first approached I like to ask all sorts of questions and they may some of them may seem silly you know I'll ask okay you want me to do a piece for the chancel, say, of your church. Are there things like, you know, heat registers? Are there thermometers? You know, are there thermostats? Are there things in the wall that I have to deal with? There's a lot of practical stuff like that. But I also ask, okay, I need to know what's fair game. I see in the photo that you sent me that there's a banner there. And I become sensitive to, can that be moved? Can it be taken down? Because oftentimes there are things in the sanctuary that have been placed by individuals in the congregation, and it's one of those sensitive places where it's like, okay, you don't want to offend anyone. And some of those things sometimes are have been in place for years. And you have to do a little backtracking, especially if you're a young pastor, and do a little research and find out, okay, who put this up? And, you know, it's questions like that that seem very odd to even ask. But you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And you have to remember that the sanctuary is just that for a lot of people. It's a place of safety. It's a place that they know they could come to every week and things will not change because, you know, it sort of reflects the Word of God. It's unchanging. The story of salvation, it's unchanging. It's always been that way, and it cannot be moved in either direction. And a place of worship where people come 
they don't like change, and they shouldn't expect change. Change is very tough. So you, when I come in, my feelers kind of go out of my head, and it's like, okay, what's fair game? What's the history of this congregation? I'll ask questions like that. Are you super confessional? Are you kind of folksy? What's the flavor, if you will, of this congregation? And I also obviously look at the architecture of the church. You know, I'm, I'm not going to put a Sistine Chapel in a, a mod squad church. It's just not going to work. On the other hand, why should I do something that is cutting edge, modern art, and something that's just beautiful gothic. Why would I do that? So you have to be sensitive to a lot of things. And the best compliments I've received are those that are essentially, it looks like it was always meant to be there. It looks like this piece was always there. So you can't force art into a church. It's got to work with the church. It's got to work with the people and still be confessional. So that's like a huge laundry list (laughs) to go through. But you have to go through it. You know, you don't want to have any regrets about having commissioned something. And 10 years down the lane, you think, oh, this is either this is dated or eh, this really doesn't work at all. So there's a lot of those things that I dig into, which is obviously having parameters. And they're not really constraints, but they're just ideas that you have to work with. It's very different than coming up with something on my own and saying, oh, I like it, so everyone else should like it. Well, it doesn't work that way when it comes to our congregation. Yeah, just to pick up on that idea that it should fit the space that it's in and to be sensitive to that, this is one thing, and I think maybe you even once wrote an article on this. I might have seen this and come across this, and I'm pretty sure that you wrote this. It also plays into church architecture, which is rather artistic in a lot of ways, at least my own personal take. And really has come out for me a lot as I'm here in Southern Illinois, and we have a lot of congregations that go back to the beginning of the Synod and really even from the first immigrants that came over and settled, of course, across from me directly in Perry County, Missouri, the home of the Synod, and of course came on this side of the river as well. And so we have a lot of sanctuaries like mine in the dual parish here that go back to the 1800s or early 1900s and are quite old. And I've seen in some renovations, and usually it was around the late 60s and 70s, even into the 80s, where they did renovations of these beautiful old sanctuaries. And you walk in from the outside and you're like, oh, this is going to be great. It's going to be like stepping back in time and worshiping with the saints back in the 1800s. And then you get in and then you see all this 70s architecture and art and even pews and things like that and carpet and and all sorts of things. And you're just like, what did you do to this place? And it's, (laughs) yeah, I I get what you mean. It's not a sanctuary anymore. So I don't know, talk a little bit about that, if you will, of, you know, how you fit that in there to be faithful to the space, but while confessing the faith. Right. Well, there's another part to the commission, and, and that is pastors often use it as an opportunity for teaching. You know, this sort of stuff isn't taught in any catechism class. It isn't taught in higher places of learning, but it's important. So you have to gently bring folks along. Yeah, I've been in churches, well, actually, the church where I was baptized, they went through this, you know, the the typical, oh, we need to build a bigger church. So they, you know, they built the church right next to it, the original church, and then, you know, they put a drop ceiling in the original churches. It was like, oh, why did you do that? It was so beautiful. And unfortunately, a lot of these renovations or so-called improvements, they're hard to undo. And a lot of education has to be put forth to make it happen. And even that idea spills over into other areas, not just art in the church, but if I may be so bold, I'm thinking of right now my baptismal certificate that I have or my confirmation certificate, and I'm thinking, oh, it just smacks of the 70s. You know, you can't escape that the design that was so prevalent there, and it, it just went through everything. But it, like I said, it's hard to undo all of that. And, and it's not that it's wrong, but it's facing a choice that was maybe not the best choice, if I can put it that way. You know, sure, my baptism is still valid, and the certificate reflects that. But, you know, at the same time, I'm saying, I wish I had a baptismal certificate like my grandfather's, (laughs) you know, where the things were ornate, where it was treated as something very special, which it is, you know. And I think that's where we run into trouble, where they ran into trouble in the 60s and 70s, where... You know, what they came up with for art or just things surrounding the Lord's house, 
they weren't all that, they didn't show that they were special. They showed that they were, I don't know, maybe acceptable. But again, I, when you're given it one chance to do something and you're doing it for the Lord, you don't want to give them half an effort. You want to give the best. So, yeah, that's the kind of thing that I'm often faced with. And yet, at the same time, like I said, I yeah, I can do the Sistine Chapel, but it, it'll look funny. It looks silly in a place that was built in the 70s. You have to kind of go with it and try to elevate what you have. You have to, you know, make the best of what you're given. Yeah. My wife always talks about she's one of my church organists. And so, again, the music end of the art spectrum for the both of us. But she often talks about how she was always taught in music, a perfect pairing of text and tune is what makes for a really great hymn. Obviously, again, confessing the faith. But if the tune and the text don't fit together, it's not going to work. And I'm kind of hearing you say the same thing in terms of the worship space that you have and, you know, kind of the other settings and so forth. You're not going to do a good job of confessing the faith. And there might even be some things lost if those don't match together, right? It's going to feel out of place. Right. Well, you don't want folks to look at the piece just because it stands out. You know, having a sore thumb in a church, that doesn't help anything. You know, even if it's confessionally spot on, people will miss that because they're forced to deal with, you know, the jarring contrast or something. You know, it's like, well, what is this thing? It doesn't even make sense visually. But, yeah, there are some subtleties there that you have to deal with. Now, the church where I'm now a member was actually the first church that I did a a large commissioned piece for. And this particular church, Our Savior Lutheran in Grand Rapids, is what I would consider a mod squad church, okay? There's nothing gothic about it. it. The top is very smashed down, and yet it has some features in it that are wonderful, okay? So the roof is almost flat. It's very low ceiling, or rel- relatively low ceiling in the sanctuary. But there are two things that are cool about this church. First of all, it was designed to hold artwork. So when I first started attending, it was like this, it almost looked like a Zen temple. There's lots of white, you know, walls, and it's like, well, what's up with this place? And then I found out it was designed to hold artwork, and I was asked to do that for the sanctuary. The second part of why I think our sanctuary is so nice is above the altar, the ceiling comes down. It is a very cool confessional thing where the architecture says, you know, we don't go up to God. He comes down to us in the divine service. So that part is, it's wonderful. Now, when I did the piece that I did for our sanctuary is based on the Te Deum, and I have the words that go all the way around. It's 160 feet long by two feet high. And it visually uh, tells or shows what's going on in the words of the Te Deum. And it was scary putting that up because I worked on this thing a long time. And it's like, okay, what are people going to think of this? What is going to go on? And I was really petrified. And it was, I did it on panels. I was able to put it up. I had a help doing this. I think I did it in two weeks. Put the whole thing up. And when it was unveiled, it was like, even from my own mind, and I'm not bragging or anything, but it just seemed like, oh, this makes sense. Visually, it like fits in this place, not just spatially, but it it makes sense. The style and everything makes sense for this church. And then I was thinking, oh, what are people, what are the reactions going to be? So I was sitting by my lonesome sort of, you know, people were milling around looking at it closely. And I, from the distance, as I was sitting, I saw a lady of the church coming toward me, and I could tell she had tears in her eyes. And I thought, oh, no, what did I do? What did I do? And she came up to me, and she pointed to the section where it shows the resurrection saints. And when I did that, I had little, I did little details. I was able to do, you know, just put in gobs of things that just sort of let my mind go. And I had, I put in a little skeleton, and I found out, and she told me, she was so grateful that I included a little teeny child in the resurrection of the saints. And also, I guess a litmus test of any piece that you put in any church. When I heard in sermons, you know, the pastor would bring up little sections. He would point to a section in the Te Deum piece and bring it into a sermon. And I thought, oh, well, that works. Yeah, I, you know, it's not like I was doing it, but the Lord was using 
this piece that I did for, you know, he was using it. And, and again, those are his, that's his hand at work. Oh, and another story about that particular piece is that when I first started the Tidam Polyptic, it was such a monumental thing that I had to break it down into chunks that I could handle mentally. And I thought, I still remember, I took the words, okay? I typed them out, just the words of the Tidam, and I measured them. I took a ruler, you know, I had to figure out how these words were going to fit on the wall. Uh, and there's things I had to deal with, you know, there's doors and there's corners of walls and there's uh, up behind the altar, there's a sort of a, a rare dose sort of construction. And I had to deal with those breaks that had to happen. So fine, I divided everything up. And as it turned out, the death and resurrection of our Lord is right over the baptismal font. And I'm telling you, I honestly, I did not plan that. I'm not that smart. And the place where the pulpit is, is right between where Christ is in glory now and when he will return. So, again, it's like the Lord is just using this stuff. I'm just, I'm, honestly, I feel like I'm an idiot sometimes. And it's like, Lord, how did you do this? <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting, but you have to be very sensitive, again, about the space. And I guess the one thing I did try to do is I didn't fight that modern feel of the building. And the imagery is almost graphic in the sense that it's sort of stylized and the figures are very, uh, like, not cartoony, but there's not a lot of modeling of the figures. There's no eyes in them. So, yeah, fitting the piece to the space visually, not just spatially, but visually, stylistically, that's very important. And serves the purpose of confessing the faith so beautifully. I mean, so much what you brought out in there. I just, I wish I could talk to you for hours. Um, but <laughs> there are a couple more things before we run out of time that I want to get into. And I think connecting in that you talked about up around the altar, how the space itself confesses that God comes down to us in the divine service, which of course is our Lutheran confession of what happens in the divine service. That's why we use the terminology divine service. God serves us, comes down to serve us in his word and sacrament. And how you fit that into confessing the art. But I also want to connect this back to what you said in terms of like baptismal certificates and so forth. And once again, this is a point where in my pastoral ministry, I come into this older dual parish and some of the older members still have some of those beautiful baptismal certificates that are proudly displayed on their walls and their homes. And they are truly works of art. And again, somewhere in the late 60s, 70s, 80s, my own baptismal certificate is just this ugly retro thing that's an eight and a half by 11 paper that <laughs> I don't really want to show. Exactly. And I think that plays into how we confess the faith as well, because whether it's just hanging a beautiful piece of art, because that's what you think about your baptismal certificate, but at the same time, it is your baptismal certificate and it's hanging there and people who come into your home are going to see that. And that says something, and that conveys what we believe about baptism. And so the, one of the first things I did was I got rid of those ugly baptismal certificates in this ministry here, and I brought back that older style again. It's beautiful. It's all done on a computer now. But again, just beautiful works of art that are 11 by 17. And I do that with the confirmation certificates as well, because that's that connection to confirming our baptismal faith. And I truly do hope that, and I know that several do, that we can confess the faith with the art and just our placement of it and what we use with it. I don't know. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. And I didn't mean this to be a you know ad for myself, but I somewhere along the line I did recreate a baptismal certificate, and it's in the old style. And I also do ordination certificates and anniversary of ordination certificates, and they're done with the same old style, something that's worthy of, you know, if we claim that, these things that are so important, which they are, then why don't we show them? Why don't we show that instead of, you know, oh, let's create this thing that looks like it was, I don't know, some goofy certificate that was designed to be put in a drawer and forgotten. I mean, that's silly. What's interesting is the baptismal certificate that I designed was recently reconfigured into a German one. A pastor in Germany asked if I would convert one. And I thought, oh, what an honor. You know, this is like history kind of flip-flopping here, you know, that I would do something that would be used in Germany. So, yeah, there's this 
basically our whole faith, everything about the church, it's like, if it's that important, why don't we show it? And oftentimes the, the sad reality is what we do doesn't show it. It, it shows like my pet the line is that, well, you know, you want it to be the Lord's house. Why are you making it look like his garage? Why can't we use the very best of what we have? If we can do it, I mean, I understand churches can't always do that. There's things like roofs that need to be repaired. I understand that. But when we can do it, let's put the best foot forward and confess to others who see this as, yeah, they think this is special, and you can see it. That's the whole idea. And that's the idea of confessing it visually. It's like, well, yeah, they must love it. You know, this must be incredibly important to them. And it shows up not just in artwork. It shows up in the architecture and music and things. It even shows up in our attitude when we're in church. You know, when the crucifix comes down the aisle, get off your duff. You stand up, you face it, you bow it, you give homage to that one who gave his life for you. You know, you do that when you're watching football games, for Pete's sake. Get up. And when you're in the sanctuary, when you see that the altar has the elements on it, respect that. I mean, show some honor to the person who is coming down among us. Oh, man, I mean, I just, I want to sheep steal you so bad. <laughs> we need more, more laity like you. And that's part of what I'm doing in this series of Concord Matters is how can we talk about some of these things? And it's so great that you're seeing that and reflecting that in what you do. Because again, I think you said something there that's really key. You know, why doesn't it show what we believe that we say this is important? But, and I guess kind of the opposite way to look at that is, is the absence of things says something too. And exactly. I've talked on this show several times about one of the reasons that I reverence the elements and lift them up and kneel and so forth in the Lord's Supper is because just kind of the lack of things in our Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate development over its history and of the last few generations and so forth, I think we've gotten a wrong understanding when it comes to the Lord's Supper. We sometimes don't even think, as we do as Lutherans, say that we believe that that's truly Christ present right there in his body and blood, and we get very casual around it. Right. And so I've been very intentional in bringing that reverence in. So again, hearty amen that you appreciate that as well. But the absence of those things has brought about a different confession in those things. And I think that that can happen in art too. If we don't include these things within the life of the church, that says something too. And it may not be something that we once said. Right. You know, there's, here's a thought. When anyone goes into any church, usually it's what they see. It's the church building. It's the architecture. It's the art. Everything will confess before anyone from the congregation goes up to that visitor and opens their mouth. What you see will confess before what you say. So, you know, if you're missing that opportunity, you're missing a lot, I think. Absolutely. Uh, with just a couple minutes left here, we'll kind of let you give us your wrap up and parting thoughts. But if you could work in there a little bit too, because I think a connecting point in here again is there's a difference between sacred or confessional art, art that confesses the faith and secular art. And you do some secular themes as well. So just go ahead and give us your wrap-up parting thoughts for today. Again, I wish we could talk to you for hours, but kind of wrap-up parting thoughts for today and talk about the distinction between sacred and secular art, if you will, as well. Sure. So sacred art is kind of a goofy term, and I feel odd using it because right away it assumes that what I do is holy. Well, you know, what I do and how it ends up in the Lord's house, he makes it holy. But the secular pieces that I do uh, sort of reflect on 30-plus years that I spent in the newspaper industry as an illustrator. So, you know, I have done those things, and I occasionally tinker with them still. But obviously the difference is the secular realm, you know, you still want to do the best you can because, you know, we're called to do that. But sacred art, we slap that label on it because it shows, okay, this is for a different purpose. It's for the use in the church, and that's it. I mean, it, you know, what I do outside of the church, and it may reflect on the church that, hey, he, you know, he does his best. Yeah, it's sort of the glory trickles back that way, but when the point is obviously to point to Scripture, that's a whole different ballgame, and that's how we, you know, that's why we put the term sacred art on it, it just as a distinction. So. All right, that's Mr. Edward Riojas, confessional Lutheran artist, 
Again, I wish I could talk to you so much longer and I probably will off the air here because I just love your work. So please go check out all of his excellent sacred artwork and his blog at edriojasartist.com. That's E-D-R-I-O-J-A-S-A-R-T-I-S-T.com. It's been a great honor having you join us for Concord Matters today and discussing with us why Concord Matters for making confessional or sacred art. Very much appreciate your thoughts and sharing deeper insights into how you go about your confessional work to the glory of God. Thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure, and you know, it's nice to have, as an artist, to let my voice speak instead of just you know, the works that I do. And yet, your works do speak so well, and as you said, too, the Lord blesses it, and may he continue to bless your work to confess the faith that he has won for us and given to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you also, dear listener, for stopping by today, and until next time, keep confessing, church. <laughs>